Alyssa, I'm so glad that elections are on Tuesdays. Isn't that nice? Because we don't get scooped. We don't get Wednesday. Um, so we're recording this on Wednesday. And on Tuesday, the Georgia runoff happened. And by late Tuesday night, uh, it was clear that Senator Raphael Warnock had won re-election, defeating Herschel Walker. And that kind of reminded me of a story, Alyssa. I'm going to sound a little bit like Rachel Maddow if she cared about football. I am so ready for story time with Erin. <laughs> okay. So the reason the reason that I'm familiar with this story at all is because I grew up a Minnesota Vikings fan. Um, so in 1989, the Minnesota Vikings were pretty, pretty good. They were like, they had a, a lot of pieces in place to be a great team, they believed. Um, the Dallas Cowboys were very, very bad. They were 1 in 15. But their best player was a guy named Herschel Walker. And uh, the Vikings traded in the biggest trade of all time in the NFL up to that point. They traded 18 players and draft picks for Herschel Walker. It was huge. It was a huge deal. The Vikings thought they got the, the better end of the deal because he was such a great player. So he came to the Vikings. The Cowboys got all of those draft picks. And over the next 10 years, the Cowboys won three Super Bowls with those draft picks and players that the Vikings were like, we'll take it all. And the Vikings fucking sucked. So what's uh, the lesson? The lesson is <laughs> this is not the first time that Texas has unloaded Herschel Walker to another state. And the other state has been like, oh, this is terrible. Why did we, <laughs> we really got the raw end of that. Um to parif or to quote Dan Pfeiffer's uh, excellent newsletter, um, yes, Herschel Walker was a terrible candidate. Dan Pfeiffer mm -hmm. wrote this. In general, it's bad when your candidate runs on an abortion ban and has paid for multiple abortions and once put a gun to a woman's head. Problematic, problematic indeed. However, we do have some sound from the loser of last night's Georgia Senate runoff that I think you actually flagged as being something that you found to be good. Heartening. Heartening. Yeah. Let's listen. But one of the things I want to tell all of you is you never stop dreaming. I don't want any of you to stop dreaming. I don't want any of you to stop believing in America. I want you to believe in America and continue to believe in the Constitution and believe in our elected officials most of all. Continue to pray for them because all the prayers you've given me, I felt those prayers. Hmm. Alyssa, what do you make of that? Okay, I really was truly heartened when I saw his speech because, one, Herschel Walker, not a teleprompter person, so I really do think he was riffing. Um, and the other thing that I liked that he said – that not only did he say those things, but people didn't boo him. I mean, like, honestly, a lot of people have no, no like, compunction about going ahead and being like, yeah, we love you, but boo to the positive sentiment. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was – I thought it was good. I mean, whether he did it because he totally meant it, which I sort of felt like he did, or just to kind of rat fuck Trump, both were fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, Herschel Walker, a bad person. There's no debate that he's a bad person, but a good right. loser. A good loser. Good loser. I mean, that how many good losers have we seen lately? So like thumbs up to being a good loser. Mm -hmm. Right. And and just in terms of the concession speech, not in terms of political career or personal caliber. No, no. Like nobody needs to fucking correct us or tell us whatever. I'm just right, talking about the right. speech. <laughs> Saying that a bad person did one good thing does not mean we think the bad person is not bad. Um, it reminded me a little bit about, of uh, John McCain's concession speech. It was his like – Now, his concession speech was wonderful. I mean, like yeah. it was truly a unifying moment, I thought, as as the winner in that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it reminded me of that just because it was like the right thing to say mm -hmm. after a, uh, a heated and close race. Um, and also, you know, Georgia is lucky to have Warnock as a senator. He's a good senator and he seems like a really good person. Um, and it's exciting that he's going to be in office for six years now. Six years. Six years. Amazing. Let's be done with the runoffs for a while. But also... Another shout out. I think we both knew this, but shout out to Pfeiffer's newsletter. Uh -huh. That fucking Stacey Abrams. Okay. Yes. We need to talk okay. about that. Let's focus on the woman 
who has built an infrastructure. And this is an interesting thing because the political class, the political class, not us, Aaron, everybody else. Yeah, they, everyone else. Everyone else. They're always like, oh, the Stacey Abrams machine and the Reed machine. And the funny thing is there's a there's um an intersection between what Senator Harry Reid did in Nevada and what Stacey Abrams did. And it's not about one person. It's not like some person created this mythical thing. They invested in the people of Nevada and the people of Georgia and created infrastructure. And that is something that will live on for forever. It is like the greatest, most altruistic thing that she could have done. And we saw it yesterday. We have seen it since um, since she started Fair Fight. And it's just – it's incredible. And it, it, is, it is truly inspiring to see how much a person dedicating themselves to making voting easier uh, could do, could accomplish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Selena Montgomery – Strikes Selena again. Montgomery rides again. <laughs> um, what, what, what else do we want to talk about? We have a really exciting interview today. Do we have time for one more story? I don't know. Dealer's oh, Choice. You know what? I do want to talk about this story just because it's been uh, – it's been taking too much of my internet time and I feel like if we don't talk about it, I will have wasted all that time. And if we do talk about it, I can be like, oh, that was for work. Um <laughs> <laughs> ABC has reportedly uh, decided to temporarily bench Good Morning America co-anchors Amy Rohrbach and TJ Holmes while the network assesses how to handle the fallout from a cheating scandal. Um, Alyssa, basically, these two morning show anchors were caught canoodling in public, very openly in public. Both of them are married to other people, and um, both of them... You know, they work together and the people that work with them are unhappy and, and all and all that. So what what do you make of what's going on? I know that you have some like you're closer to the story than I am. I have some thoughts. Here are my thoughts. One, who cares? They're consenting adults of equal power structure. I do not care. I think it is crazy that they were taken off air or or maybe there are things we don't know, whatever, but taking them off air didn't seem to matter. The real tr- the real problem with this story in their behavior is that anybody thought that they could privately canoodle in Times Square. <laughs> what? Dummies. You and I both know the Irish bar that they Come were on. caught yes. canoodling. We were texting that about is it. <laughs> not a canoodle bar. That is not that is there are so many canoodling opportunities in other neighborhoods in New York City. What we we Soho Great canoodling opportunities in Soho, right? Look, go to the quiet streets of Soho. Go to Fidei. Go anywhere. Times Square, the Irish Bar. Not, not what a no, how, no. How silly. Also, one of the details from this, I, I'm I'm with you that I think there's something really weird about how the public really gets on a moral high horse about marital infidelity among public figures specifically within news media it's like the, it's like it reminds me of like they want them to be like disney princesses or they want them to be like mickey mouse and just be like mascots for purity right. and, and moral perfection and that's always been sort of weird to me the like public insistence on like these people being monogamously married is is weird um, I think that it's bad form and I feel really bad for both of their spouses and I feel really bad for and their any, kids, their kids. Like that's a crappy thing to do to your family. Um, but I also learned from the story when I was reading, reading up on it during my deep dive into this rabbit hole. Um, they recently documented their journey training together for the 2022 to New York City Marathon. OK, another mistake. Do <laughs> not start fucking somebody that you're doing workouts with because the like love hormones and the workout hormones get all tangled up. You're not in love. Oh, that's good advice. You're not in love. You just worked out. You're not in love. (laughs) You've just got runners high. Like go, go take a shower and lie down and just do whatever you want by yourself. You're not in love with your training partner. You just went running. That's uh, yeah, as a as someone who it. used to run a lot. That's that's something I gotta I gotta put out there. Um, yeah, I just so I, ho- I, hopefully we have now exercised this. <laughs> what a pun! Uh, we have exercised this story from our feed. <laughs> I just 
I hope so because I I've got a finite amount of time and and I I can't give any more minutes of my dwindling life to this story. But I can't. No. But I also like. Why is it so compelling? Like, why am I like, ooh, what do they do? Is it because they were so stupid? Is it because the whole it's thing the is so- It's the canoodling in Times Square part. If yeah. it were not for that, we'd be like, we would truly be like, oh, I don't care. But but when you, but it's like the pictures of them in Times Square, you're like, wait a minute, what are you doing? You're what in you doing? Times Square. Like, that's a, it's also the place where like the people who watch morning television are most likely to be. To go on vacation. Yes. Yeah. That they're going to. It is a tourist hotspot. They're going to come to New York. They're going to stay in or around Times Square. They're going to go to the M&M store and then they're going to go down to the 9-11 museum. And 100%. that's what, like canoodle, like canoodling in the 9-11 museum would have not been more obvious. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so that's that's uh, that's all I think I have to say about that. And I'm glad that we were able to like talk about it because now I lay it to rest. I don't feel as bad about spending so much time reading about it. OK, <laughs> we're going to take a quick break when we come back really excited for our interview this week. And welcome back. Alyssa, you and I both know that there are some people who have been on our list for quite some time. Our bucket list, you mean? Our faves. bucket list of, of, of faves, of interview subjects, of people we would love to talk to, <laughs> people who are doing important work. But for whatever reason, our schedules haven't quite matched up. Today, we are checking one of those people off of our list. Today's guest is a member of Congress representing California's 14th District, which covers part of San Francisco and the Bay Area. After a decades-long career dedicated to fighting for women's rights, LGBTQ rights, minority communities, national security, and a less corrupt government, she's finally going to get to relax, we hope, when she retires in January. Representative Jackie Spear, welcome to Hysteria. Aaron and Alyssa, great to be with you. I have wanted to come on your show for a long time, so it's my bucket list too. Oh, oh that's great. Well, we just oh. came, we we got in under the wire. Uh, holiday, con- holiday, congratulations! Joy. Yeah, congratulations on your upcoming retirement. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you came to this decision and what you're most looking forward to doing once you're no longer reporting to work at Congress? <laughs> so I've actually dubbed it my unretirement because I have no intentions of you know, eating bonbons and watching uh, soap operas. So um, (laughs) I am leaving, though, because I've served now in public life for 40 years, 15 years in Congress, and uh, it's time to pass the torch to the next generation. But um, I still feel passionately about the issues that I've worked on, and I don't intend to remain silent on the sidelines. So I've got lots of little irons in the fire and we'll see um, what they all develop into. Amazing. Well, your career in politics started pretty harrowingly. For those who don't know, as a young congressional staffer, you and your boss at the time, Congressman Leo Ryan, were shot by members of the Jonestown cult while on a fact-finding mission in Guyana. Congressman Ryan and four other people were were killed. Um, You've credited Congressman Ryan as your mentor. Can you talk to us about how that tragedy shaped you and your politics? Well, I was lying on that airstrip, shot five times, uh, my whole right leg blown up, my right arm blown up, a bone going, um, protruding out through um, the skin. And I vowed that if I survived, I would dedicate my life to public service and more and most importantly, not take another day for granted. So I've tried to live by those principles and Congressman Ryan taught me for the short time that he was my mentor, that experiential legislating is key. You cannot legislate uh, in the halls of Congress without going out and being um, with the people that you are representing or the people you're trying to help. So for instance, I serve on the military personnel subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee. I chair that committee. Um, I go to the bases to find out about the issues of sexual assault. Um, I went to Alaska to look at the issue of suicide, which was um, a a number that was kind of devastating to all of us to see the increase. Uh, I just recently spent um, a number of days at Hell Week for the Navy SEAL uh, program because we had a Navy SEAL candidate who died after completing Hell Week earlier this year. So 
um, my work um, is never done. And certainly the experience of being on the ground, wherever that is, is important. Congressman Ryan went to Guyana because members of the People's Temple, which was a church in San Francisco, but more properly defined as a cult, had members that had become a part of the People's Temple who were constituents of his, young young adults. And his constituent parents were concerned about their well-being because they had become part of the church. And then uh, a group of about a thousand of them went to Guyana in South America and created a commune called Jonestown in the jungles of Guyana. Congresswoman, as someone who's experienced violence that was incited by violent rhetoric, how concerned does the current state of the political discourse make you? What can be done to bring the temperature down? Well, I think the rhetoric is at an all-time high for violence. And we need to look no farther than a a month or so ago when uh, Paul Pelosi was bludgeoned almost to death um, by an assailant who was looking for Speaker Pelosi and broke into their home. Uh, The January 6th uh, tragedy uh, was created by violent rhetoric, um, by our then president and groups that wanted to take advantage of him as well, because the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys were all about um, you know, dismantling government. And they saw uh, then uh, Donald Trump as one that they could hook their, their star to. So it is dire. And I would say that unless Congress makes a concerted effort to lower the temperature, um, we are poised to um, see more of this. And so it's really the responsibility of each and every member of Congress to stop, to stop putting out poison pill um, memos and tweets and uh, carry on on the House floor in a manner that is unbecoming to the institution and to the process and does not get us closer to solutions. And that's what the American people want. Compromise mm-hmm. is a good thing. It, it is not a dirty word. Mm-hmm. Has Leader Pelosi filled you all in on how Paul's doing? Do, do you know how he's doing? Uh, she has told us that he is recovering, but it is a slow process. He made his you know, public debut again just very recently at the Kennedy Center Honors. And um, I, you know, he's a, a strong man. He's a, um, someone who has supported his wife in one of the most consequential jobs in the country uh, for decades. And I know that he would you know, like an opportunity to have more time with her and, and, and she with him. And that's why I think she made the decision to step down as speaker. Hmm. Um, you've been a fierce advocate for reproductive and LGBTQ rights before it was cool, you know, as they say. Um, <laughs> what, have, what have been some of your biggest legislative wins that you'll look back feeling most proud of? Uh, I, I think I'm going to be most proud of the fact that I was arrested for um, challenging the Supreme Court decision and Dobbs and uh, 17 other colleagues joined me in uh, being arrested um, because civil disobedience is part of the solution here. Uh, it is absolutely um, critical that we overturn the Dobbs decision and we can do it through Congress. Um, We could do it through another lawsuit conceivably, but to think that somehow government mandated pregnancy is freedom is outrageous. So um, I feel very strongly about that. In terms of reproductive health generally, I was the first legislator to speak about my own abortion on the House floor back in 2011. The gentleman from New Jersey has just put my stomach in knots. Because I'm one of those women he spoke about just now. Which I think um, allowed women across this country, 25% of whom who have had abortions, 
um, be able to feel comfortable speaking out about it. Um, mm -hmm. It was um, not something that was done with any degree of, um, he was a, it was a wanted um, baby. It was a, a decision that was made in conjunction with my physician and my husband. And it was a 17 week abortion. So it was a second trimester abortion. Um, so uh, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the work that I've done to try and get um, our service members who now will require abortions, but live in uh, states have, or actually posted in states where bases um, are precluded um, from um, accessing abortion care locally. Uh, you can't get abortion care at a military treatment facility, believe it or not, and pay for it yourself. Um, that needs mm. to change. We weren't able to do that. But to the extent that they're stationed in states that ban abortions, we now are being um, able to provide them transportation and two days of convalescent care for um, their need to access abortion care elsewhere. Mm. You know, I remember that speech in 2011. It it meant a lot to me. Like, I remember it very clearly. I think, Alyssa, you probably remember yeah, it pretty totally. well, too. I wasn't even working in, in D.C. I was in New York, and it, it meant a ton. Um, you've been open and candid with your own experiences with sexual harassment. Do you feel like you had to share your experiences in order for progress to be made? And do you wish you didn't have to? So I talked about the sexual harassment I had endured because I wanted women in Congress, staffers, to feel that they had an advocate for themselves in me because I had endured it as a staffer myself. Um, years earlier, I had tried to get the Rules Committee to mandate sexual harassment training for members because I was successful in doing that in the California State Legislature. And the chair at the time, who was a Republican, said, no, I could do anything like that. Um, so when the Me Too movement took off, I thought, all right, this is my opportunity. So I did the video and then, um, you know, the, the, the walls came off the, um, the Capitol because so many women and men have endured sexual harassment in these environments and have been loath to talk about it because they wanted careers here in Congress or it, the system was rigged against them. Uh, previously, um, it was the member of Congress who was represented by counsel when someone complained about sexual harassment, not the victim. Mm -hmm. There was mandatory uh, mediation. There was mandatory cooling off periods. And then the non-disclosure agreement and the settlement were paid for by the taxpayers. So we turned all of that on its head. And now uh, as a staff member, as an intern, as a fellow, um, you have those protections. You'll be represented by counsel. Um, you do not have to go through any of these mandatory mediation processes. If you want to go to court, you can go to court. If there is a settlement, it's going to be paid for by the perpetrator, in that case, uh, the member of Congress. As you think about your new phase of life, like you said, you've been a public servant for 40 years. Is there a congressperson you're going to miss seeing every day? Oh, there's going to be a lot of Congress members that I'm going to miss because I have great friends here in the Capitol. Um, and I'll still be able to um, tweet at them and <laughs> text them. And when I see something that's gone crazy, I will let them know. <laughs> is, there, is there anyone you'll be happy to never see again? Oh, there's, there's individuals that <laughs> I don't engage with that I'm not going to miss, um, but I don't engage with them now, so I'm not. Too concerned about it. Oh, and that is so high road. <laughs> yeah, that is. We kind of thought you might high road that one, but we thought we'd ask anyway. Um, <laughs> are there any political changes you hope to see in the next few years? You know, if I had my way, I would change the way we do business here. Um, here we are lurching to some conclusion with the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, we have either to pass a continuing resolution or an omnibus piece of legislation so the country can continue to operate, so government can continue to operate. Um, I would like to see us do two-year budgets, um, actually budget for a two-year period of time in the first year, and then the second year, do the oversight that we don't do enough of. 
You know, we pass laws and think that they're then going to be followed. And the truth is, that's not necessarily the case. And so unless we do the oversight, we're not going to have the accountability that we should expect being pursued. Hmm. And then one of the things we did in the state legislature in California, we would, you know, not pass a budget in time and um, there would be this huge process that would go on. And then there was a, a law passed, I think it was actually an initiative that said members wouldn't get paid if they didn't pass the budget by a certain time. And you know, lo and behold, they've never had a shutdown as a result. So something we might want to pursue in Congress as well. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, Congresswoman, you're a lifelong Californian and the holidays are here. So what Bay Area comforts of home will keep you feeling warm and festive this December? Oh, well, um, putting up the tree is always a major event in our house and decorating the table. I do tablescapes, that's how I uh, relax. So, you know, it takes me a good day to, to put a tablescape together and get the house all ready for the holidays. Um, we do all the things that, any family does, whether it's caroling or going to um, festive uh, parties with friends. And um, I'm looking forward to doing all of that, all of which start this weekend, as a matter of fact. And then <laughs> Amazing. One of Wait. the things I do for the um, one of the nonprofits, um, I help them wrap presents. They have a huge um, area at the fairgrounds and there's gifts that poor, poor families can come and and identify. And then um, I'm one of the chief gift wrappers because I did that when I was 16 years old. My first job was doing um, Christmas wrapping at Montgomery Wards. Um, oh, that takes time. <laughs> blast from the past. <laughs> I remember that place. Yeah, I am a, you know, four star general when it comes to wrapping presents. And uh, so I'll be doing that and um, finding ways to, to give back to the community. OK, so I have so many questions about the tablescapes, but I want to ask you about <laughs> wrapping. What is the most challenging shape to wrap and what's the trick to doing it? Well, the most challenging shape, of course, is one that doesn't fit into a box <laughs> and trying to you know, take skis, for instance, and, and wrap them so that they're um, you know, not discernible. Um, <laughs> then what you need to do is just put lots of bows on it so That's people are focused <laughs> One of the things I like to do is take a very small present and put it in a very big box. So it <laughs> uh, puts people into an idea that they're getting something they're really not getting. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Congresswoman Jackie Spear, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for everything you've done for uh, the people you represent and for the American people. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you. 